Welcome to Authors of the Pacific Northwest, where we connect authors with new listeners and provide advice to aspiring authors on the business of writing. I'm your host, Vicki J. Carter. So hi there, podcast listeners. Thank you so much for coming back to the Authors of the Pacific Northwest. And I have the privilege of introducing you to Kathleen Valenti. So Kathleen, would you like to say hi to our listeners? Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to have you because you're writing some of my favorite stuff. Um, So we're going to talk a little bit about your genre here in a bit. Um, But before we get there, um, share with us um, what state in the Pacific Northwest you reside in. I'm in Oregon. I'm in the heart of Oregon in Bend. Bend, yes. So I have a lot of authors from Bend. (laughs) Probably because about a year ago, I had a newspaper article that came out in Bend, which was really exciting about the podcast. So, um, and you guys have quite a writer's community there. (laughs) You know, it's true. It didn't used to be that way, but it's really grown into something wonderful. There's a lot of energy here, which is great. Yeah, I love it. I mean, and I hear Ben's super beautiful. I've driven through Ben, but I haven't stayed long enough to really know how beautiful it is. But from the authors that I've met on the podcast, I'm kind of thinking I need to take some time down there and go check it out. You definitely do. (laughs) Yeah, awesome. Awesome. So um, in way of introduction, Kathleen, also, I like to ask a few questions and a couple are stumper questions that I didn't send to you because I purposely do that to make it interesting. (laughs) But the first one, I I think you knew this one in advance. Um, Talk a little bit about your background. I know that you um, have quite a writer um, history, but have you always been author? Did you have, do you have another job besides being an author or did you? Yeah, that's such a great question. So I am a writer, uh, not only as a novelist, but in my day job too, I'm a copywriter, which means Mm -hmm. I write ads for a living. And I've done that for 20 something years and so I like to say when I'm not writing, I'm writing. It's like I'm <laughs> always in that sandbox, you know, nouns, verbs, adjectives, I'm there. Yeah, yeah. So with the copy editing, so I know copy editing pretty darn well. I'm not, I don't write it myself, but my daughter does. She worked um, in as a graphic designer and mm-hmm. advertisement for quite a few times, quite a few years. So I know a little bit about copy editing from her. For you, what's the big major difference between writing literary work versus copy editing, copywriting? It's so funny because I sort of figured that there would be a really direct crossover because I've been doing it for so long. And I thought, you know, I've got the discipline. Um, And I think it's it's, it's a couple of things. For one, the form factor is so much longer. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're copywriting an ad, you know, a 30-second TV spot has maybe 70 words as opposed to like 90,000. So that's a big part of it. Um, and also the thing I think was the biggest discovery was learning that there's a difference between good writing and good storytelling. Ah. And it's great when you have both, mm-hmm. but I learned pretty early on that you cannot rely just on good writing. Like you can, you, you can kind of do that with copywriting, but not so much with novel writing. You have to have you know, flesh and blood characters and interesting plot. And, you know, sometimes you can actually have those things and have just okay writing and still have a great book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm so glad you said that too, because I would think for copy editing, cause you have such a small amount of space to develop uh, emotional attachment for your advertising. You have to be very precise and able to hook in, but then hooks need to be there for, literary writing too you have to hook the readers in so (laughs) that's kind of what I think about I don't know the difference because I'm not doing what you do (laughs) well you nailed it I mean that's true me you have to have those hooks and that does actually come in handy for novel writing too because it's handy to have those hooks to start and end each chapter so I've at least got that. The rest is, you know, work in progress. Yeah, yeah. Well, aren't we all? <laughs> I'm just discovering. Yeah. I'm just not there yet. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah. So um, when did you realize that you were going to do writing as a life, uh, as your career? Did you land a copy editing first? Did, is, did you go to school to do that? And now you're like, okay, now I want to breach over to the other side. Kind of walk us through that aspect. Oh my gosh. Well, it was kind of a long, circuitous route. I was an English and psychology major, Mm -hmm. which I loved um, at at University of Oregon. And uh, when I graduated, I didn't really have a very clear idea what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, writing was something that was kind of in my toolbox, but it turned out that there was not a lot of call for people, you know, asking me to like analyze Jane Austen or something like that. Um, and so I didn't really know what to do. I, I spent some time in education. I worked in alternative ed, which was great, mm-hmm. but I pretty quickly discovered that my mom was actually a teacher. And I think that you're kind of called to that kind of work and you have yes. a real gift for it. Mm-hmm. I did not have that gift. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good you discovered it. And you didn't stick it out trying to figure it out. <laughs> exactly. So I was in that world for maybe five years and then quite accidentally fell into copywriting. Um, there was kind of this grassroots um, class that I took and I landed a job at an agency and one thing led to another and then my agency got sold. And so I'm now currently working for an agency that's based in Portland, Oregon that has offices in Portland, Bend, if you count me, and then in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, oh, so it's kind of funny. It was an accident, but it was actually sort of perfect because, you know, I had this kind of strange, you know, double major thing that turned out to be ideal for copywriting. I mean, English and psychology. I mean, those mm-hmm. things really work together when you're trying to, um, you know, inspire someone to think, you know, a certain way about a product or a brand. So it just worked out. And I would think that it would also work out for literary fiction, honestly, because you have to understand uh, your readers well enough and psychology of human nature to be able to write well, <laughs> I yeah, think. Exactly. And especially, you know, character motivation. And mm-hmm. um, and I think that's been another big light bulb for me is, you know, you just can't have characters that sort of move like pawns around this chessboard of your story. They have to have, you know, volition that's born of weakness and desire and that kind of thing. So that does come in handy having that, that psychic background. I love it. I think that's great. I, I won't claim to be a, a psychological background, but I am a study of human nature. I can't help myself. You, you take me anywhere and I'm watching everything around me and what people's interactions. I just love it. And I'm like, oh my goodness, some of the stuff I got to write down to keep it because I'm going to use it for my future books. <laughs> it's the best education of all, honestly, it really is. Yeah, yeah. So Kathleen, I like here's one of the stepper questions I like to ask as authors were told you should be reading a lot or reading mm-hmm. often. And so what books are currently on your bookshelf that you're right reading? now? I'm actually I'm almost done with Liv Constantine's uh, new book, The Last, I think it's called The Last Time We Met. I hope I'm getting that title right. And um she's the author, actually the team of sisters, and they authored The Last Mrs. Parrish, which um, was a really big success. So it's been really fun to watch that career unfold mm-hmm. and read this second book, which it's it's not part of a series, but it definitely has sort of a similar world. Um, and that's been really fun. And oh my gosh, what else did I read recently? Um, I'm a big, you can tell I'm just sort of in the mystery genre. I'm a big Ruth Ware fan. And I think The Turn of the Key is the her next book that I have ready to roll as soon as this one's finished. So uh, I've always got mystery or thriller or suspense. I get kind of stuck in my genre, but that's not what my passion is. Well, and I think we're supposed, I mean, uh, all the advice that I've been given is to read in your genre for sure. Um, It's going to be very, very inspiring. And so, and I love mystery. I don't write mystery, but I love mystery, but I love a really good mystery book because I feel like sometimes as a writer, I can figure things out faster than maybe other people would. (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> and that's the real puzzle, isn't it? I mean, even on the writing side, it's like, you know, how much do you give away so that, you know, there's fair, so that it's a still a surprise, but there's some fair play where it doesn't feel like a gotcha. Yeah, exactly. And I'm the same way with movies. My poor <laughs> husband and family hate watching movies with me because <laughs> almost, you know, 10 minutes in, I'm like, oh, I know where this is going to go, where these characters are going to go. And I have to, I've learned to keep my mouth shut, even though I want to tell them because I want them to know how brilliant I am, but it ruins everything because I'm usually <laughs> right. And they're like, you just ruined the whole movie. <laughs> well, my special talent is I'll like stop the movie and say, I want to call it and then like say who I think it is. And I would say like more often than not, I'm completely wrong. <laughs> Everyone laughs at me. I love it. I love it. Well, um, I I just trained myself to be quiet and just watch, enjoy the movie. And when I am pleasantly surprised by a movie, that's the one I'm going to talk about for a long time yeah. afterwards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. 
So you revealed your genre. So why don't we launch into that right now? Tell us, you know, what your genre is and your book titles. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the writing process for you. Fantastic. Well, I write the Maggie O'Malley mystery series and I would describe them as sort of medical mysteries. Um, you know, not quite the case Scarpetta. She's um, in the world of uh, the pharmacological world. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, kind of like light medical mystery and a little bit of thriller in it. Uh, there are three books so far in the series. The first book was called Protocol. And I was lucky enough to be nominated for two awards for that. The um, Agatha and the Left Coast Crime Lefty. So that was a huge honor. Congratulations. Thank you. And I, you know, that was a really fun book. That was definitely a a great learning book. The second book in the series is called 39 Winks. And um, I really enjoyed that book too. And then the third book came out this spring and it's called As Directed. Oh, nice. And they're all in the same, the same uh, character. So it's a series. Yeah. Same character, Maggie O'Malley and Mm -hmm. company. Oh, fantastic. I own company. That's so smart to have company in there. (laughs) (laughs) Right, Maggie and friends. Yes, yes. Because you never know who's going to pop up when you're writing these stories, who needs to be added in. (laughs) Yes, that's the truth. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the writing process. Did you have an idea where these three books were going to go? Did you write one first and then the other two came along? Uh, Or did you have, do you have a series in your mind and you kind of know where each one of those books are going? Well, it's kind of funny. I call this my dirty little secret, but it's actually not so much a secret anymore. I actually wrote the first book, Protocol, as a standalone. Oh, um, okay. I know. Crazy. And um, it's it's about big pharma, and it definitely is more of a thriller. And I, I want it to be in that world because with a thriller, sometimes you have these you know really high stakes, which often require sort of these larger-than-life characters and issues. And honestly, big pharma is um, really fertile ground. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, especially affects all of our lives. I mean, something like 75% of us take medication. So there's, you know, we're all, or many of us, I should say, are, are affected by pharmaceuticals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, kind of the long story short is that I had this prospective publisher and they said they, they loved the book and they loved the characters so much they wanted to make a series. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's such great news. But oh my gosh, that's not what I was thinking. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, and so there was a moment of panic, like, "Oh no, this is going to be a series. How will I do that?" But they said, "Hey, we know you can do it. We think this character is good for the long haul." And so um, I think they were right. Um, we launched the first book, and then the second book was sort of the proving grounds to see if I can turn the standalone into a series. And it required a little bit of a tweak to um, Maggie's career path. Mm -hmm. That actually has um, turned out to be really interesting, kind of a really fun part of it to see her grow and change just like we all do in real life. I think that's so absolutely exciting that you had a standalone book and didn't really have in your mind it being a series, but a publisher was like, we want this and we want as a series. That is what I feel like that would be an author's dream but I can understand there's a lot of pressure there. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's like and, and a big learning curve. I mean, since my background is advertising, um, you know, it's a, it's a blessing in some ways because I write about a lot of diverse topics. So I'm used to doing that, but, you know, writing protocol and learning about how drugs are brought to market, required a lot of research. And I'm lucky enough to have a friend who's actually in big pharma, mm. with a really important resource. But then I realized I'm going to be tapping these people um, this friend and then doctor friends for a long time if I'm writing this series. Yeah, yeah. Well, the beautiful thing about friends and research is that we can tell them we've created something in the book that was a part of them. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's beautifully said. We get to immortalize them in a legacy. So <laughs> most people are pretty okay with that. Yeah, very true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. How exciting. So let's jump into the publication process or um, journey for you. Um, had you Did you so- decide that you were going to go independent publishing? Were you looking for an agent and, and it went f- to a publishing house? How did that work out for you? Yeah, you know, what's so great about um, the publishing world these days is that there are so many avenues and they're all wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I decided that I wanted to do kind of the traditional route which meant getting an agent. Mm-hmm. And that proved to be, I think, honestly, the most difficult part. Um, 
you know, it's a querying process where you, you know, sort of tell the premise of your book and see if agents are interested in the rejection rate among agents is something like 99%. Yeah, it it can be terrifying, honestly. (laughs) Yeah. One thing that was, I think, a saving grace is that because I'm in advertising and I write for a living, I'm used to having people comment on my work. Yeah. So when I would receive comments or rejection, I was able to kind of take it in stride and not be completely crushed, which I think is good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, But I just stayed the course and I found a wonderful agent and, um, you know, got some interest from a variety of publishers. And we went with a a wonderful independent publisher called Henry Press. Mm -hmm. And they do... um, they do a lot of mystery and some, you know, sort of uh, women's fiction as well. Most of their mystery is um, more cozy mystery, which is, um, you know, a little bit kinder, gentler, you know, no cursing, you know, violence pretty much off the page. So mine is not quite a cozy, hmm. it's quite for those parameters, but it's cozy-ish and it has some of those traits, but it, it's a little bit out of the box for them, which was great that they took that chance on me. Yeah, and then they wanted to expand it. So that's super exciting. Yeah, and they've just been wonderful. So yeah, I mean, really very much a happily ever after with the agent and with the publisher. It's been, it's been great. Oh, I love to hear that story because I don't always hear that story. I've interviewed, I'm going on 60, 70, 80 authors. I mean, I've interviewed a lot of authors, haven't put all of them out on in publication, but I did it for the whole purpose of me learning this, you know, what's out there now um, yeah. as I'm, and I, I don't always hear that fabulous story. <laughs> with yeah, it's nice yeah. when it happens. Yeah, exactly. So give us a tip um, about what you learned about looking for an agent. What's a good tip you can share with us? Uh, well, there are a couple things that were helpful. There are a lot of resources out there. Um, Writer's Digest, you know, I think is a wonderful resource. Their online um, community. They've got um, new agents profiled, and those are oftentimes... Um, good people to query because they're looking to build their client list. Um, there's also something called a uh, query tracker, and that's also a great resource. And so, you know, those are kind of like the mechanics of it. And then when you get into the actual querying, querying process, I would just say um, make sure you're following the directions and also be mindful that sometimes it's, you know, about what the agent is looking for for his or her list. And sometimes it's about the readiness of the book as well, because I'll say with protocol, um, I had a lot of, you know, oh, we really love this book. We love the characters. We love the premise, but it's not quite there. So I think being open to the idea that you might have to work on your manuscript a little bit more to get it ready to go to market, because that's really what they want is important. And just that stick to um, especially since you might, you know, there, there's going to be rejection along the way. I think very few people are going to get that agent or right out of the gate. I mean, it happens, but I think it's probably pretty rare. Yeah, I think it's rare too. And it, um, from what I've heard, you know, I haven't had my own experience because I'm still on the fence of what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm working on my first manuscript. So it's not even, I don't feel like it's ever ready or it will ever be ready right. to go there, but I'm going to have to let it go someday and just jump in. Um, but I, I think that's awesome advice. And Kathleen, I want to make sure that um, we get those two resources that you mentioned. So I, I, so I put in my show notes, the resources that um, authors suggest. And I don't think I've heard of the the Curry um, tracker one that you mentioned yet. And I think that would be an interesting one to put in show notes for other aspiring um, yeah. authors like myself. So wonderful. It really, yeah, it was really handy. I hope it's still active. Um, I mean, cause it's been a while since I've been in that world. Yeah. At the time I was looking, oh my gosh, it was a really great resource because it not only told you who was looking for what kind of um, manuscript, it was also a community where people would say, oh, she's on vacation or. Oh, oh that's fantastic. Her. And we could support each other too. So it was just a really nice, there's other communities like that too, but that's just the one that's top of mind. Well, we'll, well, listeners, we'll see if we can find it. And if it's available, we'll make sure that it's in my show notes because I'm going to look at it myself. I'm curious. (laughs) Yeah, nice. Yeah. So, so talk about support groups. When you had that manuscript before you found your agent, you thought it was going to be a standalone book prior to, you know, looking for agent or currently now as you're writing, you know, the other novels, do you, what kind of support groups do you have? Do you participate in associations or online support groups? Yeah. You know, it's funny when I first was uh, writing protocol, 
I was kind of lone rangering it, honestly. Um, and looking back, I think I missed a lot of great opportunities because I'm now tied into um, this wonderful community. And I, I don't know if it's just crime fiction. It's probably not. It's probably writing in general. But uh, honestly, they're the most supportive, wonderful group of people. So funny because we, you know, talk about these horrible crimes <laughs> and ways to off each other. But I mean, they're just wonderful. So yeah, I belong to Sisters in Crime. Oh, which cool I, name. <laughs> yeah, they are great. Highly, highly recommend. It's a national organization. They have chapters, um, you know, at the state and city level. And they're great. They have online resources as well. They're, they're wonderful. And it's not just for women. There are also misters in the Sisters in Crime community. <laughs> and they're wonderful. Um, I'm also a member of Mystery Writers of America. Got it. Okay. They're great. And um, international thriller writers. So I know I'm talking a lot about really specific genre um, groups, but those are kind of the main ones for crime fiction. And then I'm also lucky enough to uh, be a regular blogger on a couple of multi-author blogs. And the women that I blog with are tremendous source of inspiration and support. So um, they can help you grow and learn and you know, we just support each other. That's wonderful. Oh, that's fantastic. And I love the fact, I, and it's totally great to have genre specific support groups because I get um, people that are listening from all across the board, from horror to romance, you know, everything. And, and mm-hmm. so they love to hear these support groups and guys, I'll make sure that those are also listed in show notes. If we can, you know, put those national, um, those national genre specific support groups for others that are out there that might get some inspiration from them. Um, so I absolutely love online groups and it sounds like your blog group is pretty darn active and helpful with each other. You probably talk about marketing too. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those blog groups have been really great. Um, one of them is chicks on the case and it is definitely women writing mis- you know, crime fiction. And yeah, it's everything from marketing to craft to just funny stuff. Uh, and that's a great resource as well. And then I'm on another one called Misteristas, which is kind of hard to <laughs> the say. The names are killing me. I love it. <laughs> they're so creative. <laughs> no, and they're so fun. They're, they're just great groups and, and help you learn along the way. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, how about you set the stage for your reading? Um, tell us a little bit about the, you know, tell us the title you're going to read from and share with us, Kathleen, a little bit about the characters that you want to share that's going to set the stage. I usually go on mute while you read, um, but okay. I am listening. And um, then at the end, let us know when you've completed it and I'll take us out of the podcast. Okay, that sounds great. All right. Well, I'm going to read a little bit from As Directed, which is the third book in the Maggie O'Malley mystery series. And I think I'd like to start by just reading the back cover copy because that gives just a good overview of what the book is about. So it says, in the shadow of a past fraught with danger and tainted by loss, former pharmaceutical researcher Maggie O'Malley is rebuilding her life, trading tests for book pill bottles as she embarks on a new career at the corner drugstore. But as she spreads her wings, things begin to go terribly wrong. A customer falls ill in the store, followed by another, and then more. The specter of poisoning arises, conjuring old grudges, past sins, buried secrets, and new suspicions from which no one is immune. As Maggie and her best friend Constantine begin to investigate, they discover that some of the deadliest doses come from the most unexpected places. All right, so I'm going to start with the prologue. Claudia Warren took too long to die. She should have been dead when her lungs stopped inflating, when her brain stopped communicating with the rest of her body. But her heart kept beating, even as her cells began to necrotize and the blood pooled in her muscles. Claudia couldn't even die right. Then again, she'd never been murdered before, so maybe that was to be expected. Claudia died alone as she did most things. She came home from the grocery store, carefully inserted her key into the deadbolt, jiggling it up and down to engage the tumblers, and tossed her purse on the counter next to yesterday's mail. She deposited plastic grocery bags on the counter, she couldn't be bothered with toting around cloth ones, and began to unpack the fruits of her pick-and-save foraging, a pack of single-serving puddings, a box of single-serving juices, an array of lean cuisine entrees, the accent capping the E in an attempt to catapult the food from TV dinner to culinary experience. 
single serving food for her table for one life. Not that she minded living alone. She relished it. She had her rescue cat, Todd, a fat tabby who bumped, his, who bumped her chin with his head when she bent to fill his dish, and her work as an advertising account exec, which followed her home every night like a stalker. Human beings? She found them overrated. They were too critical of her missteps, too overbearing in their suggestions, too fair. And yet the moment she knew something was wrong, very wrong, she had a sudden and intense urging for that thereness. Her cheating ex-husband, her meddling mother, the woman next door who pilfered coupons from her mailbox, it didn't matter. She would have taken any of them. She needed help. She needed someone there. She needed someone to stop her heart from stopping. Stink. Claudia tried to cogitate her way into living, to assign reason for her certainty that she would die before next week's work trip to Tobago, or she'd smile and nod and pretend to be interested in her client's plans for a new beachside resort. Claudia's head exploded in a blinding streak of agony. She put her hands to her temples and dropped a magnum bottle of Pinot Grigio, the only supersized indulgence she allowed herself, and staggered against the counter. She broadened her stance as if fitting her sea legs and tried to ride out a wave of vertigo. It didn't work. She swayed, recovered, swayed again. She tried to focus on what was happening, the cascade of pudding packs from counter to floor, the puddling wine, the blackness encroaching at the periphery of her vision like a wolf coming in for the kill. None of it made sense except maybe a new pain, sharp and insistent, seared through her body, blunting her thoughts. She dropped her hands from her head and clutched her neck. She pawed at unseen hands that seemed to close around her windpipe, choking out her breath, her life, her future. She fell to the floor beside the shattered wine bottle and the shards of glass that trailed behind it in a wake of gravity and destruction. The wine ebbed from the bottle, breath ebbed from her lungs. Todd nosed Claudia's cheek, his whiskers tickling skin that had already begun to turn ruddy with hypoxia. He bumped her chin. Claudia's head flopped like a doll's. He bumped her again and entreated to move or perhaps catch CPR. Claudia's head lolled again, eyes fixed on the tiny spider webs that her feather duster had missed. Claudia's vision darkened. Her lungs burned clean of oxygen, throbbed. Then everything stilled. Her heart, her mind, even Todd the cat. Claudia finally succeeded in dying. Chapter One. Maggie straightened her lap coat and examined her reflection in the glass of the medical-grade refrigerator. The new overhead bulbs had turned her skin sallow and transformed her teeth into a shade she imagined could only be called beaver dentin. She dragged her fingers through her hair and mashed her ginger curls into a struggling bun at the base of her neck, then chanced another look in the glass. She was a dead ringer for Uncle Fester. Not that Maggie particularly cared what she looked like, she was more interested in action rather than ornament, what she could do over how she appeared. But still, it was her second day as a bona fide pharmacy tech rather than an intern. She had her preliminary license. She began studying for the state exam. She wanted to look professional, put together, not like someone who, need, who needed more bilirubin in her bloodstream. Maggie scrubbed her teeth with her forefinger, examined the yield, squirted hand sanitizer from an industrial-sized pump onto her palm. She was a professional after all, then hurried back to the counter, making a mental note to ask Tom, the store's part-time janitor, if he could replace the bulbs he'd installed with a non-jaundice-inducing variety. Maggie took her place behind the register and surveyed her, her new dominion, the little row of conjoined waiting room chairs, the blood pressure machine, the laminated barrier that separated prescription seeker from prescription filler. This was a pharmacy section of Petrosian's pill box her new professional home, the launching pad of her new career. She felt a fridge of excitement at the newness, the sense of being reformulated, as if she were a bottle of shampoo with more frizz fighting power than ever before. She was an occupational phoenix, reborn from the ashes of her career in pharmaceutical development. Goodbye, Maggie O'Malley. Hello, Maggie O'Malley 2.0. The plan, pharmacy technician today, pharmacist tomorrow or at least soon. So far, day two as a pharmacy technician was going smoothly. She pushed pills into bottles, measured out liquid medications, and affixed labels to containers. 
It was the most independent she'd had since her on-the-job training had begun six weeks earlier. Forget her master's in pharmacology, her award-winning graduate work, her extensive pharmaceutical knowledge. When he worked for Levin Petrosian, pharmacist and business owner, freedom was tough to come by. Maggie fluffed her lab coat, straightened her name tag, and eagerly awaited the chance to carpe, carpe the hell out of the diem. Petrosian had left her in charge of the pharmacy while he ran errands. Phoenix was up for her first solo flight. The phone rang, her first opportunity at autonomy. Maggie answered, took Mrs. Duncan's refill order, then told her to have a very nice day, filling luxurious Mr. Perlative, and replaced the handset. A, move, a movement in her peripheral vision caught her eye. Maggie looked up. A girl, perhaps nine or ten, was prowling at aisle five. Aisle five was Maggie's favorite section of Petrosian's pillbox, a no-man's land between health and beauty where shoppers could procure gastronomical delights like Vienna sausages, apple juice, and hard candies. The girl circled the hostess rack like a shark. She surveyed her quarry, picked up that package of Twinkies, ruffled its cellophane edges, then repeated the process with ding-dongs and raspberry zingers. With the zingers, she held the package longer, turning it over, setting the end as if looking for an expiration date. She brought the package to her nose and inhaled deeply, eyelids fluttering. Maggie wondered if the girl could smell the cloying scent of coconut or red 40, or if she were reliving an olfactory experience. As if on cue, the girl sniffed deeply again. She looked over the shoulder of her stained Viking sweatshirt and licked her lips. Then she curled her fingers around the package and slipped the zingers into her pocket. Maggie breathed in sharply. Shoplifter. Before Maggie's mind could tell her body what to do, the girl was in motion, feigning interest in other snack cakes, mulling mini muffins, fingering palm-sized fruit pies, sauntering to the front of the store, one tattered sneaker in front of the other in a silent, in a silent tightrope walk. The girl reached the door and pulled. The overhead bell pealed once, an alarm rather than an adieu. The the girl looked up sharply. So did the woman at register one. Not just any woman, Francine. As far as Maggie could tell, Francine specialized in being annoyed. Ask her where to find the heating pads, annoyed. Ask for paper instead of plastic, annoyed. Answer no problem instead of you're welcome, annoyed. Francine slit her eyes and put red-tipped fingers against bony hips. Excuse me, she called. The girl froze. Excuse me, Francine repeated. Where do you think you're going? The girl turned. Her face flamed against the white sweatshirt, nearing the red and white striped zingers in her pocket. I was just leaving? More than a question, a request for permission. Francine flipped her hair and nearer to the evangelically teased dew, secured on each side with white butterfly clips. Francine shook her head. I don't think so, hun. We don't just let shoplifters waltz out the door. The girl's mouth hinged open. Thought you'd get away with your five-finger discount, didn't you? Thought you were too good, too clever to pay like everyone else, didn't you? Francine sniffed. Oh, now you'll pay. She lifted the receiver of the phone next, next to her register. I'll make sure of that. Maggie watched as Francine dialed. She took in the girl's matted hair, the ragged jeans that hung on her thin frame, the way her pallid skin sheeted the prominent bones of her cheeks and chin. Maybe the girl was hungry. Maybe she was homeless. Maggie imagined the girl picking scraps from a trash can, waiting in interminable soup kitchen lines, bringing home, bringing home food to a sibling who begged to have a belly filled with something more than, than hopelessness. The thought galvanized Maggie. She thrust her hand into her pocket and brought out a, wa- a wad of wrinkled bills. She rang up a sale, shoved the money in the till, then grabbed the receipt. She hurried to the front of the store, no great feat given the pillbox's small size, detouring down aisle five for a few sticks of jerky and a can of beef stew. Francine, Maggie called. Her lab coat billowed around her like a poly-blend cape as, she, as her walk became a jog. Hang on a sec. Francine's head swiveled toward Maggie as if it were on a spit. The cashier regarded Maggie, angry black eyeliner hooding flat, flashing blue eyes. What is it? She snapped. Just wanted to give this girl her receipt, Maggie, Maggie said. She pressed a thin rectangle of paper into the girl's hand, then closed the small wrinkles, 
and small fingers around the proof of purchase as if it were a visa to a kinder place. Francine replaced the handset and folded her arms across her navy blue smock. Her necklace of multi-sized red balls pressed against her skin, creating tiny dents in the pale sunspotted dermis. You're saying she paid for the cupcakes? Zingers, Maggie corrected, and yes. Plus, she forgot these. Maggie nodded to the girl who obediently stuck out her arms. Maggie loaded them with the few foodstuffs she'd hastily selected. Francine made a guttural sound that was half scoff, half wretch. <laughs> she bought those? Yep, Maggie smiled at the girl. Thanks for shopping Petrosian's pillbox. Come again soon. The girl stood rooted to the spot, her eyes darting from the food in her arms to Maggie, then to Francine. Maggie gave another nod, and the girl spun on her heels and shouldered open the door. She didn't have a bag, Francine said, as they watched the girl tear across the parking lot. I'm sorry, Maggie said, as the girl disappeared around the corner. The girl, a head bobbed toward the door. She didn't have a bag. I found that suspicious. Maggie shrugged. You know how environmentally conscious this generation is. Right. Francine picked her tooth with her pinky and leaned against the register. I've heard about you. You like to get involved, this said like a dirty word. You're young and pretty and have a background as a fancy scientist. But you're also new here, so here's a nickel's worth of free advice. She keyed in a code and the register door sprung, sprung open. She picked up a roll of quarters and slammed it against the corner of the drawer. Stay in your lane. I'll take that under advisement. Maggie strolled back to the pharmacy counter, fingernails digging into her palm. Cheeks reddened with anger. A few years ago, she would have blushed with embarrassment. Ashamed to have received a scolding, appalled at her own boldness. But that was before she knew her worth. Before she knew how much she could do. Before she'd been made, before she'd been made into something harder and more resilient. Maggie 2.0. Stay in her lane? Keep her nose out of other people's business? No problem. As long as people like Francine didn't give her reason to do otherwise. Maggie ducked beneath a miniature Dutch door counter that separated retail space and sacred pharmaceutical ground and snagged a cardboard box. She scooted back out, intent on restocking the shelves and her good mood. She assessed her task. Love and Petrosian was particular to the point of rigidity, committed to not just following the letter of the law, but alphabetizing each letter. Drills to create labels and process insurance claims. Early morning runs to restock shelves. Tori's had tasked her endurance as well as her patience. Petrosian's training was more like a boot camp. The only things missing were push-ups next to the please wait beyond this, behind this sign, this line sign, and forced marches down the analgesic aisle singing, I don't know, but I've been told the last aspirin has just been sold. Funny thing was, Petrosian liked his new employee, adored like a daughter of Polly, her fiancé Constantine's aunt was to be believed. Another funny thing, Maggie adored her grumpy, taciturn boss right back. Part of that esteem was born of the events of last year, part from what she learned, what she'd come to learn of her boss. He was a man of integrity, kindness, and generosity, Good moods? Well, that was another story. Maggie's father wasn't much different. She had plenty of experience dealing with curmudgeons. Maggie propped a cardboard box on her hip and popped the lid. She swished her hand inside. Plastic bottles of Pepto-Bismol knocked against each other. She grabbed a smooth cylinder and got to work. Starting with the aisle's end cap, she placed bubblegum pink soldiers against dyspepsia on the white metal shelves. One by one, she arranged the bottles, facing out labels, adjusting placement for reachability, checking that prices were clear and visible. She rounded the corner, plastic bottle in hand, humming ACDC's Thunderstruck, inhaling the pharmacy's signature perfume of cleaner and plastic, and nearly stumbled over a man sprawled beneath a display of Tums Chewy Bites. And that is the end of chapter one. I am thoroughly in love with Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> I love her too. Oh, she's great. I have a really good picture in my mind. So great details right out of the bat with her, but I do love her. So now I have to read the books to uh, fall more in love with her. <laughs> so, oh, and, I hope you do. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. 
So a wonderful work, Kathleen. Now, before you go, leave us and my listeners, some of them are listeners, but uh, for reading, hearing new authors, but a lot of them are aspiring authors or authors in progress. Leave us with a tip. Oh, my biggest tip would be honestly to read, read, read. Like we talked about reading in your own genre is great. It's also good to read other genres to cut kind of that cross pollination, but Honestly, read the authors that you admire the most and um, just keep at it. Awesome, Kathleen. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here and and um, I look forward to uh, staying in touch with you and maybe when you get your fourth book out, we'll bring you back on. Thank you. Thank you so much for hosting. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you for listening to the podcast. We hope you enjoyed the episode as much as we did. Follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter, where you can be entered automatically each month to win a signed free copy of a book from an author that's appeared on the podcast. You can find out more at our website, www.squishpin.com. And finally, if you're an author in the Pacific Northwest and you would like to appear on the show, you can find out more on our website. So until next week, I hope you enjoy the journey. This is Vicki J. Carter signing off.